You may not know Max Obyshevsky, a peace activist and self-styled romantic revolutionary. Max has spent his entire adult life working for peace. He's had no other occupation or interest. He is perhaps the last of the activists remaining from the seminal Vietnam War resistance movements of the 1960s. And he has never wavered, seeking peace, fairness, and justice in the world. Max lives in Baltimore, Maryland, with his partner Janice, a former Catholic nun. I had a chance to spend several days with Max, who, at 73 years old, still goes tirelessly about his life's vocation, every day working for peace. This building over here is where I, I was working at the American Friends Service Committee before we moved up New York Road. The Peace Center, the Baltimore Nonviolence Center, that's where I first had my job in Baltimore, May of 1983, with Nuclear Free America, helping set up uh, nuclear-free zones around the world. Uh, Max, you've been a political activist and an activist for peace and nonviolence literally almost all your life. Tell us about some of your early, early experiences which kind of galvanized that uh, in you and kind of focused that as a mission and made that kind of your life's work. Well, uh, I, you know, I'm Polish-American and I think I'm, I'm part of that tradition of a romantic revolutionary. I've already told you about running into a, a former nun in a bar, and she's the one that planted the seeds. Do something constructive with your energy. And that's when I, I, I got really involved. I started following the Berrigan brothers. I mean, I was raised Roman Catholic. I was not aware of any priest getting arrested. And when I started finding out about Phil Berrigan and Dan Berrigan getting arrested and eventually going to jail, it was, it was just shocking. Max, you mentioned the Catonsville Nine. This was a seminal event in the anti-war movement that just galvanized so many people. And this, this happened in 1968, this, the, the burning of the draft cards. Can you kind of summarize what happened there? Were these Roman Catholics, nine Roman Catholics, some of whom were priests, some of whom were nuns, they got a manual, U.S. Army manual, about how to make up home, homemade napalm and they pour the homemade napalm and then they let it. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This action just lit up the country, the world. Tell us a little bit more about your relationship with the Bergen brothers. They were your mentors. You had a, a, a personal relationship with them. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, there, was a, there was a writer called Coleman McCarthy, and he, he eventually started writing for the, uh, for the Washington Post, and he, he would write about peace and justice issues. And I read in there that the Berrigans formed something called the Jonah House in Baltimore in the 70s. Because I had remembered them from the Canesville 9, 1968. Now I hear about them forming this Jonah House community, this resistance community, and by, by happenstance, by who knows what, the role of the cosmic dice, I wind up in Baltimore. I'm working with Nuclear Free America. I'm also, uh, 
visiting the American Friends Service Committee office in Baltimore. And so this is my first visit to the Jonah House. This is my first meeting with Philip Berrigan. And I go to Washington with the group and we sit down in front of the, the, the uh, White House gate and we refuse to move. But this was my first political arrest. I was very nervous, very scared, et cetera, et cetera. So this was my first entree into the Jonah House. And to take this quite, quite further, we had the Plowshares Movement. And the Plowshares Movement was this idea that Phil Berrigan came up with, and this was to take Isaiah, turn swords into Plowshares. Well, because of my first arrest with the Jonah House, Phil recognized me as a potential activist, and I started joining him on his plowshares and other plowshares. And he mentored me in so many different ways. With Dan Berrigan, now Dan was a Jesuit who lived in New York City. I've been to his apartment. It was a museum. I got arrested with him on Times Square when we were protesting a company on Times Square that was doing was doing Star Wars research. And I'd go up to New York for, he had, a, he had a 75th anniversary, he had an 80th birthday party there, and then uh, I was there uh, for his funeral, which was one of the most, most magnificent events I've ever been to. There was standing room only. More than 800 people, though, packed into the Church of St. Francis Xavier in New York Friday for the funeral of Dan Berrigan, the legendary anti-war priest, poet, and activist. He died April 30th at the age of 94. Raid in 1968 and me for a draft board raid. Along with his late brother, Phil Berrigan, Father Dan played an instrumental role in inspiring the anti-war and anti-draft movement during the 1960s, as well as the movement against nuclear weapons in the early 70s. He became the first Catholic priest to land on the FBI's most wanted list. You could see how many people love this, this kind pacifist Jesuit who is speaking out on so many issues. And to be blessed to walk on the planet, to walk in the same space as Dan and Phil Berrigan is something that I will always treasure. The American Friends Service Committee, like many uh, nonprofit organizations, is sort of in decline. Donations, et cetera, are going down. We hand out peace diplomas every year at Johns Hopkins University, and we ask the students and the families to work for peace. And we talk about inside the peace diploma about how much money goes into military contracts. But Johns Hopkins University is usually number one educational institution for military contracts. And as we were talking earlier, Baltimore is in desperate straits for infrastructure. President Trump promised that he was going to do something about infrastructure. I haven't seen any progress in that. So, tell us about uh, a few years ago when you went to protest Henry Kissinger here in, in Baltimore. I, can, I consider uh, Henry Kissinger a war criminal. By happenstance, he was scheduled to come to Baltimore. So our group, the Baltimore Emergency Response Network, went down to greet him. Three of us went in. We didn't get very far. We were, part. We were arrested. And the judge leads over. He says, Max. Why don't you plead no low contender? But I said to the judge, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but I cannot plead guilty. This guy's a war criminal. What I was doing was right. It was an opportunity to preach uh, against what he did and speak truth to power. And I was convicted, but I was not given any jail sentence or anything like that. That's just one of many times when you have to stand up and you have to say something. I tilted windmills all the time, but at least I can sleep at night that I did what I could when Henry Kissinger came to Baltimore. Now talk about uh, whistleblowers in, in general and and how the government uh, uh, makes it sound as if uh, it, it will be benign and to your interest if you see some malfeasance or some corruption or some wrongdoing. And what in actuality happens when, when you have whistleblowers? Tell us from your standpoint, Max. Well, uh, Janice and I and many, many others 
were incensed at what happened to Bradley Manning, today Chelsea Manning. So here's a situation where she exposed what our government was doing in Iraq. And anyone that has seen this video, where there's, there's, a, there's I think it was an a, a Apache helicopter, is observing this group of Iraqis. Eventually, you see the commander give the shoot to kill. They kill these people. See all those people standing down there? Yeah, Roger, I just estimated there's about 20 of them. There's, yeah. Oh, yeah. Back over here, six, one, or, correct, Roger that. Uh, we have no personnel east of our position. So, uh, you are free to engage over. Alright, we'll be engaging. Okay. Roger, go ahead. Just in. Once you get on, just open them up. Yeah, Roger, yeah. Um, nah. You're clear. Alright, uh, firing. Line here. Line, uh, Let me know when you have it. We'll shoot. Light them all up. Come on, fire! Hey, Roger. Keep shooting. Keep shooting. Bodies laying there. Oh yeah, look at those dead bastards. This is one eight. Uh, we also have one individual uh, appears to be wounded, crawl, trying to crawl away. Then next, his father taking his two daughters to work. I mean to school, and they attack him when he gets out of the out of the uh, vehicle. His daughters are sitting in that van watching their father get killed. Come on, let us shoot. something that our government should be releasing. Bradley Manning releases this information and he gets whacked. And he got a 35-year prison sentence for speaking truth to power, revealing information that we as citizens should have access to. He's being tortured when he was in jail in Quantico. Dennis Kucinich, was not, who was a congressperson at the time, was not allowed to go in to see him. The UN Rapporteur for torture was not allowed to go in to see him. So Daniel Ellsberg, Colonel Ann Wright, myself, and 34 others were arrested there demanding treatment for Bradley Manning. Yeah. Now you mentioned uh, Daniel Ellsberg. Now t talk about, uh, you know, the, the Pentagon Papers, which was kind of like the first really major incident that the public became aware of, of government lying and government cover-up. The United States would wage its unofficial war for nearly a decade. In 1971, former military analyst Daniel Ellsberg released the Pentagon Papers. I'd been in the Pentagon when we started the bombing campaign. I knew we were in the course of dropping many times the tonnage of World War II on Vietnam. I came back from Vietnam understanding that there was going to be no kind of success and nothing but a bloody stalemate in Vietnam and felt that we should get out. The concealment of this information for 25 years has now led to the death of 50,000 Americans and several hundred thousand Vietnamese in the last few years, a couple of million over 20 years of this involvement. And I think that uh, the odds have been weighted in favor of secrecy. The classified Department of Defense files revealed that since 1945, Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy and Johnson had misled Congress and the public about unconstitutional military actions. Those beginning in the 1960s included secret raids on Cambodia, Laos, and North Vietnam. Uh, my family believed in the government. My family did not think a government would lie to you. I think it was our generation that was exposed to people like Daniel Ellsberg to find out that, yes, our government lies. Uh, to me, Daniel Ellsberg is one of the great heroes 
of our generation. And he was facing very, very severe consequences. And he was a member of the elite. He was someone that was going to sacrifice everything because he had in him that he has to tell the truth. He realized how much our government is lying. But I know people that went to Vietnam from our generation coming back with malaria. I was sending packages to guys from the neighborhood to support this. Not only was there protests taking place in the anti-war movement, but the GIs were resisting. There was all kinds of things going on where GIs in Vietnam and elsewhere were being put into stockades because they were refusing to kill. The average age of the people being killed in Vietnam uh, were, was 19. You couldn't even get a drink in Erie, Pennsylvania, but you could go and be killed in a war that you had no, known nothing about. It was a ridiculous, illegal, immoral war. Now, Max, um, uh, speaking a little bit more about um, about whistleblowers, tell us a little bit. Most people don't know who John Kiriakou was. Can you tell us a little bit about John Kiriakou? The thing to remember is he was a member of the Central Intelligence Agency, and he knew that, that torture was taking place. In the, the congressional committees, both in the Senate and in the House, were, were not broadcasting that our government was involved in torture, and even claiming that it wasn't taking place. Enhanced interrogation, etc., etc., etc. Well, he blew the whistle, and the hammer came down on him, to say the least. And he served, I think, a year and a half prison sentence for saying the United States he, you know, he told the reporter was involved in torture. So whistleblowers are always, always damaged. So I, I support every whistleblower because they're the people that are speaking truth to power. Now, Max, one, one of the kind of the, the most well-blown, I would say, today whistleblowers, someone who's been holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy in, in London, and that's Julian Assange, and although he's not a U.S. citizen, what give us give us your your capsule on the on the Julian Assange situation? So Julian Assange uh, is 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 the founder of WikiLeaks, and their philosophy, as I understand it, is total transparency. And we know it's well known that the government covers up its war crimes, its mistakes, its whatever. And so Julian Assange. Uh, was working, as I understand it, with Bradley Manning and had the information that Bradley Manning turned over to WikiLeaks and it, it revealed all of these, these war crimes by the U.S. government. As a result of that, the United States has, actually has an indictment down in Virginia, and that's, that's where there's an indictment waiting for Julian Assange. So, he realizes this and he flees to the Ecuadorian embassy. The previous government welcomed him. The new government has actually shut off his, his computer access and is presume and it's a right-wing government that's you know following the orders of the of the British government and the US government. Well, let, let's talk about Tom Drake at the NSA. He blows the whistle to a reporter at the Baltimore Sun about how the NSA was actually spying on, on uh, individual citizens inside the United States, which is illegal. And this poor guy got hammered. He, 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 he had an Air Force pension, and then he had a pension through the National Security Agency. He lost both pensions. He had to pay over $50,000 in, in costs for lawyers, and then they dumped him. When I saw him the day he, he pled guilty in, in U.S. District Court in Baltimore, he had a federal public defender because he couldn't afford a lawyer. His marriage broke up. Th this is not unusual for whistleblowers, and it's obvious the government doesn't want whistleblowers, and so they're going to they're going to whack them as much as possible. We find out that the Baltimore Intelligence Squad was on the second floor filming us and watching people going into meetings.
The American Civil Liberties Union released documents Thursday showing undercover officers from the Maryland State Police spied on peace groups and anti-death penalty protesters for over a year from 2005 to 2006. And intelligence logs obtained by the ACLU under the Maryland Public Information Act revealed that covert agents infiltrated group. According to the documents, police monitored and entered the names of activists in a law enforcement database. What you see in the documents today is a particular individual, Max Lomachevsky, sitting to my left, who is listed um, in the Maryland High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area database with under the suspected crimes of terrorism. <laughs> Mr. Obashevsky is a person who has devoted his entire life to nonviolent, peaceful protest activities on behalf of peace. If there is anyone in the world who is further from a terrorist, it's hard for me to imagine them. Longtime peace activist Max Obashevsky from the Baltimore Pledge of Resistance joins me now from Washington, D.C. Tell us how you learned about what was taking place. Uh, you just played a clip of uh, David Rokow from the Maryland ACLU speaking. David called me to say they got this information from the uh, attorney general's office is that you've been listed as a terrorist. Uh, I mean, I know as a longtime peace activist that I'm being surveilled, and these documents are released as just a, a tip of the iceberg. Uh, but to be labeled, put into a database, uh, and, and accused of uh, terrorism, I'm a pacifist. The idea that the Maryland State Police, the Homeland Security Division, is going to be coming to meetings that I attend is beyond comprehension. These are open meetings. You advertise yes, them exactly. for people to come. They're advertised. There's flyers put up. Uh, the rallies are all announced. We, you know, anyone can come to our meetings. You know, it's just sad that people are using that kind of money to go after pacifists non-threatening passives well, all in all we're saying is obey the constitution and there was there was a whistleblower inside the national security agency that was giving out information about what the nsa was doing how they were violating the constitution philip berrigan uh, read the articles, he contacted me, and he said, we have to have a demonstration out there. So now it's 1996, and Phil Berrigan, Jeremy Scale, and I risk arrest here. So that was the first demonstration since the 70s out here. And so each year now, we come out to the National Security Agency to, to deal with what we think is uh, unconstitutional behavior. We also come out in October, because that's keep space for peace week. And if anybody's been following the situation, we find out recently that Trump, President Trump, wants to actually form a space force to control the airs. And this has been in the planning stages for years, but to actually try to take over space. There's an international treaty that does not allow weapons in space, especially nuclear weapons in space, and the United States is a signatory to that. We generally write a letter in July and October before coming out asking for a meeting. We've never been given a meeting. So, uh, Max, after, after all these years of being in this, in this movement and seeing so many things, here we are in uh, 2018. What's your hope for the future? Where are we? Have we come full circle? What's happened to the anti-war movement? Well, I'd, I'd be uh, ignorant, I guess, if I were to say we have a thriving anti-war movement today, uh, as I said earlier, when when, we, when I was working for the American Friends Service Committee and we were getting ready to protest what uh, Bush was going to do first in, in uh, Afghanistan and later in Iraq, many, many people were coming out. But I, I really think we have individualism in this society where people are looking for instant success. But if nothing else, I do witnessing. And by witnessing is you speak out, regardless of whether you're successful or not. And sometimes, as Phil Bergen would say, you never know if you're successful or not. You might find out 30 years later when somebody writes his memoirs or her memoirs 
that, hey, we had an effect we didn't even realize we had an effect on. Well, here's a situation you may not know about, but over 50%, sometimes as much as 60% of the federal discretionary budget goes to war. Said we need that money. If, if that's something we can't stop, and, and Trump is just out of control with, with what he's spending on. And Trump wants to have a military parade. I can't believe this, a military parade. So the issue, the issue to me though is the, your question. All of the people that are turning out now, more and more people are recognizing that we have to stand up. I've been working on so many issues. Martin Luther King taught us that the arc of justice, there's an arc of justice and it tends to go towards justice eventually. So I would argue, answering your question, we are at that time at night when it's very, very dark. It looks grim. We have no hope. But then the sun rises. That sun is coming up. And hey, the people are waking up. And I see great hope right now. So I have this hope. I don't think that I'm accomplishing very much. But it doesn't matter what I accomplish. I'm going to go out there and speak out. So there is a movement going on. So I see hope. I see resistance rising. And I'm hoping I can be a part of this forever.